Welcome to River Foursquare, where we gather together to discuss God's words in communities. You can find out more at riverfoursquare.org. You can click on that Connect tab and learn all about our communities and where they meet, and also our all-community gathering that is happening this month on Saturday, September 21st at 6 p.m. at Grace Church in Federal Way. We come for worship and prayer and time together with communion with Jesus, and it's a beautiful time. So come out for that if you're in the local Seattle area. And finally, thank you so much for continuing to give and support what God is doing in and through River Foursquare. You can do that at riverfoursquare.org by clicking on the Give tab, or you can text 84321. Jesus, we uh, come before you today in our communities, gathered together because you told us to do that. And that organization, that church, you said the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And we thank you for that promise. You've given us your spirit to be our teacher. So do that today. Be the one who teaches us today, Holy Spirit. And use the words you've given us. Use your gifts and talents and ability to show and to teach what needs to be shown and taught. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we talked about that our God still does, that Mary had went to the tomb early in the morning to, uh, to prepare and to anoint the body of Jesus. And Mary went to the tomb looking for dead people. You only go to the cemetery for one thing, to see dead people. That's what you go to. And so she went that day expecting to find dead Jesus. But dead Jesus was not dead, therefore he wasn't there. It's the only thing you find in cemeteries are the dead. Jesus is alive. She went and got the disciples. She's like, the tomb, the stone's gone. Shows up. They see that Jesus isn't there. And then eventually Jesus shows up behind her, you know, shows up and goes, Mary, I'm right here. But she couldn't see the alive Jesus because all she could see in her mind was the dead Jesus. God had done a miracle. God had shown up, but she couldn't see it. She couldn't recognize it because she wasn't looking for it. She wasn't expecting Jesus to be alive. We have to expect God to do things. We have to expect God to do miracles. We have to expect God to do the promises he said he would do. We have to look for Jesus. We have to look for what God is doing. We have to see those more than our circumstances. Because if we focus on what he said he would do, or let me phrase it like this. We have to focus on what he, we, he said he would do. Because if we focus on his promises, God will take care of our circumstances. And we can see what he's doing. So here's a question for our communities here. So how did you see Jesus at work this week? Were you looking for him to be at live and at work and doing things in your life? Was he bigger than those circumstances that you were facing when you hit challenges or rough spots or something came up? Was he there with you? How was that for you? How did you experience him this week? How did he connect with you? How did you see the alive, working, powerful Jesus at work in your life this week?
we've all had these moments in our lives where we've seen something and are like, that's incredible. Whether it be a gadget or a gizmo or something that did similar, like that's mind blowing. That's amazing. Or whether it be the power of God in our lives. We've seen these things and seen how he works. We're like, that's amazing. That goes beyond description. That goes beyond our comprehension. That blows our mind. That's what's happening to the disciples right now in the story. Their, their mind is being blown. And that even though Jesus told them exactly what he said he would do, that three days later he would rise, he took blatantly, it's blowing their mind. And they don't know how to wrap their head around what's actually happening. They're, they're dumbfounded. And that's where we pick up in the story here that Jesus has risen from the dead. Mary has seen him. Mary has reported back to the disciples, Jesus is back. He's back. He, he's not dead. He, he, he's back. And the disciples don't know what to make of it because they haven't had this encounter with Jesus yet. They don't know what to make of it. And that's where we pick up here in John chapter 20, verse 19 to 20. So on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus is alive. Shows up in the middle of the group of the disciples. Mary had already saw him, reported back to the disciples. That, that, now that same evening of the day that Mary had gone to the tomb, that same evening that Peter and John had ran to the tomb, same day, okay, context, same day, that night. Remember, they went in the morning, so they've had, what, 12 hours of trying to disseminate what in this world just happened. They have 12 hours to disseminate here. And they said they locked themselves in a room. The door was locked. The Apostle John makes special note of that. The door was locked. Why? Because they were scared to death. Not of, not, of, not of risen Jesus. They were scared to death of Caiaphas. They were scared to death of what might happen to them. Because Caiaphas, remember, that was the high priest who wanted Jesus dead. Killed Jesus. Wanted Jesus, or wanted Jesus dead. Turned Jesus over to the Romans to crucify him. And now they fear for their own lives. What is next for us? Now, Passover is over. Remember, Passover? Same. It's over. Um, are we next on Monday morning? Are, they, are we going to hear a knock on the door and they're coming for us? Now, with the doors locked shut tight, Jesus shows up in the middle. The word appear is not the right word. You were going to say something? He doesn't like come in like a Star Trek, like, he does not beam in. The word appears, it does not do the right word because it has this amb ambiguity of being a ghost or a spirit. And that's simply not the case. He shows up. He just shows up in the middle of the room. Doesn't go through the door. Shows up in the middle of the room. And that's where we see in Luke chapter 24, verse 37 and 42, talks about that. But when they, had, they were startled and frightened... And they thought they saw a spirit. Okay, let's stop here for a second. They thought they had saw a spirit. Because remember, they're in the middle of the room. They are scared to death of what Caiaphas might do. Jesus shows up right in the middle. Boop, there he is. And so they're thinking he's a ghost. They're thinking he's a spirit. He's, a, he's an apparition. They got their ghost hunting detectors out there like, doot, 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 right? They're EMF. They, they, they think he's a spirit. Because remember, Jesus or Mary had reported, I saw Jesus. They don't know if Jesus is physically alive. They don't know if Jesus is a spirit. They think maybe Mary saw a ghost that day. They have no context of what actually happened. And Jesus now showed up in the middle, and they're scared to death. They're like, oh, I don't know what's happening here. Let's go. Let's pick it right back. And they were startled and afraid, and they thought they saw a spirit. And Jesus said, and he goes, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. 
See, it's me. Touch me. See. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like I do. Spirits you can touch, or physical things you can touch. Spirits you can't touch. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still believed, and they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, and he said to them, Have you had anything to or do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. They thought he was a ghost. They thought he was a spirit. But they really didn't believe. They didn't quite believe the report of Mary. Mary, Mary's a little loco in cabeza. A little emotionally distraught. Other than Jesus' body is dead, Peter and John says, yeah, he's not there. But there was a joy and, and a marveling and a what in the world is happening moment. And Jesus returned. We have, to, we have to get this in context. Jesus did not return in a spirit form, right? Jesus didn't return spiritually. He, re, he, he came physically, not as a ghost, because ghosts don't have flesh and bones. That's what he said. He goes, touch me. Look, I'm real. He's just as real as a person sitting next to you. You can touch them. That's the realness of Jesus. Not only that, but he goes, do you have anything to eat? Why? He's showing them. He goes, give me something to eat. Because ghosts can't eat. <laughs> they give him I can only imagine they kind of gave him fish and expected to, like, him take a bite and, like, fall out. Bloop. <laughs> fall on the floor. Like, nope. That stayed in. That stayed in. He, he ate. He breathed. He engaged in respiration synthesis. Do you guys remember this from my algae class? Respiration synthesis, which is the process of you taking oxygen in going to your lungs, your lungs then disseminating that oxygen, causing life. Jesus engaged in respiration synthesis. He had cellular structure. Let's, let's go nerd here. He had cellular structure. He digested food. Because if Jesus didn't digest food, it's still there. Right? Right? He did everything an alive person did, does, because he's alive, actually alive. And locked doors couldn't keep him out of the room. A tomb couldn't keep him in. That's why we said is the, 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 when the stone was, was moved from the tomb, that wasn't to let Jesus out. He was already gone. And I don't know how that happened. Seriously, I don't know how he showed up in the room. I don't know, but he's alive. And he's just as physical and real as you and me. He is back. He has victory over death. And he, once again, I'm going to say it again. He's alive. There's nothing our God cannot do. So here's a question. So put yourself in that story. Think about you're with those 11 disciples hanging out in the room. You're afraid of what's coming next. You don't know what to do, what to expect. Who's going to be knocking on that door? And, then Jesus appears in the middle of the space, the, your friend. And how do you think you would have reacted? What do you think you would have done? Like knowing who you are and that kind of a shock and that kind of a thing. Like, what do you think your responses and your reactions would have been? What do you think it would have been like to be in that space? Talk about that with your community.
There's nothing our God cannot do. That statement is never more true than it is right now in this moment in this story. And not just for the disciples, but for every believer since that moment. It rings true. This has to be our resolve. Our resolve has to be that there is, we have to know that Jesus, our God, my God, your God, the Lord, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, he is in charge and nothing is impossible for him. Conquer death. Comes back to life, not as a ghost, not as a spirit, but just as alive as you and me, just as those people sitting in your community right now, breathing and eating. And that one day we will rise again too, just like that. Just like that. He's the firstborn of many brethren. One day that too will be us. Once again, Jesus isn't a ghost. We have to remember that because I know, I, I think we got to wrap our head around that. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a spirit. He's just as real. Flesh and bones. Yet locked doors didn't stop him. He just showed up in the room. So that word appeared is not the right word. He just showed up. He just showed up in the room. There's nothing our God cannot do. And, and we have to know that. And what it all means is simply this, is Habakkuk 2, 4 again. The just or the righteous shall live by faith. Also mentioned in Galatians, also mentioned in Romans. We are to live by faith, by trusting in him completely. And here's the thing, that the word of God, the message to us, get this is for us to do that, to live by faith. And he's calling us to trust him more. I'm telling you this prophetically, seriously. Okay, stop. I'm telling you this prophetically. He's calling you right there where you're sitting to trust him more. We're going to need it. That's why he's telling us to do this, to trust him more. You are the righteous you are the just. So live by faith. Live by trust. You are the just. You are the righteous. Live by faith. Live by trusting him more. Less relying on what we can do and more relying on what he can do and what he's already done. Salvation, we know this. That we believe we, if we ask for forgiveness... He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why we memorize scripture, right? It's the core of our relationship with him. It's based on trust. Because one day when we breathe our last, we will be present with him. That's the promise of salvation, to be absent from the Lord, is to be present with the body, which is why we memorize scripture. That's faith. That's trusting in him. That seems impossible. Yet, it's true. And that's why we believe. There's nothing our God cannot do. There's a question for us. So do you feel like you live, when it says to live by faith, and what we're talking about here in trust in response to Jesus that he's in charge and he's leading and he's he's guiding your life that that's that's your go to do you feel like you live by faith and why or why not talk about that with your community
Our God is relatable. Our God is dependable. Our God is faithful. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let's look at Joshua, Old Testament. Mind you, we, we, could, we could pull out, or we'll just pull out Joshua here. The city of Jericho. Israelites were supposed to conquer it. Biggest and baddest city of all the land of Cana. The walls needed to come down in order for them to conquer the city. What happened to the walls? They fell. They fell. There was another battle where, where Israel was in the middle of, of fighting. And the sun was starting to get long in the, in the sky, if you will. AKA, it was starting to get late afternoon. And they're like, they looked at how much the battle was left. They looked at their, their, their watches and were like, mm, their sundial watches. And they're like, we have a problem. So what happened? Joshua spoke to the sun and God made the sun stand still. It was in Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 to 13. It says, at that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day. And when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still at Gibeon and the moon in the valley of that weird long word there. And the sun stood, stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jashir? The sun stopped in the midst of the heaven and did not hurry to set for a whole day. There's nothing our God won't do. There's many battles, and you see when the children of Israel are fighting in the promised land, that they would decimate the entire enemy. They would wipe out the entire enemy, yet not one man of the Israel army was lost. How is that possible? Because there's nothing he can't do. Let's look at Moses. He led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They're walking, getting ready to go into the promised land, and there's a Red Sea there. Egyptian army is, is coming. Chariots, horses, the whole thing. Rolling, rolling, rolling. God parts the Red Sea. Scripture says they walk across, not on muddy ground, where, you know, like, you ever on the beach when a wave goes out, it's muddy and sand? No, it's this on dry ground. So not only, that's the biggest miracle, not just see part of the Red Sea, but he made the ground dry. They went through it, and when they got to the other side, because the Egyptian army then followed them into the sea, they're like, we got to go. There's, mind you, they're probably just as surprised as well. They followed him through that path in the Red Sea, and what happens? Uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 45, and Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts were cast in the sea, and his offers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered him, and they went down into the depths like a stone, a.k.a. when as soon as the Israelites were out of the Red Sea and the Egyptian army was in the middle of it, the waves, whoosh, came back. They were lost in an instant. There's nothing our God can't do. Even the crazy fact that God fed them for 40 years, six days a week, with this bread-like substance, I can only imagine being born in that 40 years because that's the only way you know to get food. That's weird. That would be like, and mind you, we, we got to put this in context. So that's 40 years, 60 days a week. That's 12,480 times it happened. 12,480 times you went and that's how you got lunch. There's nothing our God can do. Jesus, he heals the sick. He, he makes the blind see. He makes the crippled walk. He raises the dead. He provides for the, our needs. He, he, the loaves and the fish are physical needs. The water into wine. He pays taxes with a coin in Matthew chapter 7 when, with, a, with, a fish in his, or with a coin in his mouth. This is Jesus. He is our Lord. He does the impossible from salvation to provision, from healing to transformation. Locked doors cannot stop him. Jesus, remember, not the don't use the word appear. He shows up in the room. Locked doors can't stop him. 
The tomb store could, could not stop him. There's nothing our God cannot do. So here's a question I have for you. I want you to tell your story of how God did say, I just, I just rattled off some through scripture. And bonus points. Tell a story you've never told. Tell a story that nobody else, you've never shared in your community. Share that story. Because I know you have some. Because you have a, as much litany as scripture does of what God has done. So tell a story. Tell somebody else's story that you've heard, that you know of, of what God has done. And bonus points, if you tell one that you haven't told the group before, because I know you have them. Let's talk about that. This same Jesus who rose from the dead is the same Jesus we know now. Same Jesus. 
Hebrews 13.8. I'm not even going to put it on the screen. This is why we memorize scripture. I'm listening. Okay. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still the same. He hasn't changed. The Jesus did, that Jesus that did miracles still does miracles. The Jesus that was alive is still alive. The same Jesus that locked doors couldn't stop, those same doors still have no power over him. He still shows up. He doesn't appear. He shows up. Whoop. I'm here. And he's calling us to a deeper life of faith and trust in him. This isn't a choice for a believer. It's not a choice. Our faith and trust is built by what he's done. I know some people say, oh, give me more faith. Easy. Go know him more. That's it. That's the secret sauce, right? That's it. Just know him more. That's how you get more faith. Know him more. Know him more. In, in Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 through 17, he starts talking here, and the, and the key part is that very last verse, but I'm going to read the whole thing for context here. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Jesus of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So faith comes from hearing and hearing the words of Christ. And I want to put this in context because we're like, oh, I just have to listen to it. That's not the context. It's not the context. But hearing there means to ingest and to dwell on and to go over and to really get in us. So faith comes by getting into us, making it a part of us, what Jesus said. That's what Paul's talking about here. That's the power of memory and scripture. That's why we're always killing you with this. Guys, there, there's a plan. There's a methodology here. To get in us, The words of Jesus. So that when things happen, Scripture comes up to the top. So when circumstances arise, Scripture comes bubbling to the top. Not our reactions. Not the things we've seen people react to. That the Word of God bubbles up. His promises bubble up inside of us. That God is revealing to us in that moment when that scripture bubbles up the, who he is and what he's doing in that situation. Because he's still the same. He still does miracles. He still changes circumstances. He still calms storms. He still gives peace. The only question that's debatable here is do we believe him? Do we trust him? And what we can do is know him more. And as we know him more, our trust in him increases. Let's look at relationships, our, our relationships here that we have with people. We know them because we've spent time with them. That we have friends that when you describe them, we all know we have that one friend who's always early. Ah, they're always early. Matter of fact, if they're late, you're concerned. You're like, um, they're, they're never late. And we all know that friend who's always late. If they're early, we're shocked. Matter of fact, we count on an evening and we're like, ah, I don't have to be ready for another 10 minutes because they will be late. Because we know them. When you're out and about in your day and you see something, you're like, man, my, my friend, man, they would really like this. Why would we say that? Because we know them. We know their likes. We know their dislikes. That's time spent in relationship. 
and we know him. To trust God more is to know him more. That's how faith comes. It comes by knowing him. It comes by knowing him. And the thing that God wants most, above all, is he wants a relationship with you. And he wants us to be brutally honest with him holding nothing back. To completely expose ourselves to him. All the inward parts of us. To let it all out before him. That's what he wants most. That's how faith is built. That's it. That's the secret sauce, because I'm telling you. I want more faith. Great. Know him. Know him more. Spend time with him. And what does that mean? Well, I have to spend eight, 18 hours of prayers. No, that's not it either. It's not it either. It's being with him, talking with him as if he's there because he's there. As you go about your day, talk with him. As in you would somebody at your lunch table room person. As somebody you'd sit down and call up and text. Call up and text. Call up and talk to or to text. Talk to him like that. That's a relationship. That's what he wants. That's how faith is built. Because you'll get to know who he is. And that gets stored. That gets stored. This is our life. We share all with him. And he, in turn, shares all of him with us. There's nothing our God cannot do. Question. So when you think about relationship and you think about growing in that relationship, do you really feel like you're advancing in relationship with God? Are you growing? How do you know that you're growing? What are you seeing in your life that's changing and moving and becoming more like him and getting to know him more? What are those things that you're doing? What is helping you become that person, that relationship connected with Jesus, growing together with him? Discuss that with your community.
So what lies before us? What lies before us is that there's nothing our God cannot do. He shows up. And locked doors don't stop him. Impossible situations don't deter him. And we have to bring these things before him and ask him to do. Ask him to do. We serve an incredibly sized God. I said it like that intentionally. We serve an incredibly sized God who does amazing things. So we need to ask this incredibly sized God to do amazing things. Let's ask him for that. Let's ask for his intervention. There are no closed doors he can't. Here's the thing. He doesn't even break, break them down. He doesn't go around them. He just shows up in them. Get that. He, didn't, he doesn't break down doors. He just shows up in the circumstances and forgets the door because I don't need a door. So let's not make more doors by not asking him. Because if there's a circumstance, situation in our life that, that seems that they are hard, that are, uh, there seems to be a block, there seems to be a locked door, let's not make more doors by not asking him. Let's not do that. Let's ask. Because we trust him and we ask because we trust him. And let him do what he promised. Remember the last few weeks we had you memorize scripture, right? To go over a promise you're holding. That's what we're asking for. There's nothing our God cannot do. So let's trust him to do that. And he will do what we haven't yet seen. He will do what we haven't seen yet seen, because he's still the same. He hasn't changed. And we live by trusting in him. And I'm gonna, we're going to close this. We're going to lead this with a promise and with a verse. I'm just going to let it rest. I'm going to let it breathe. Because he gets the last word. I'm not going to get the last word today. He's going to get the last word. And it's in John chapter 16, verse 24. This is, these are the words, of, these are red. If you have a red letter edition Bible, these are red. Is in, these are the words Jesus said. Until now, you've asked nothing in my authority, in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. So Jesus, we come right now, and we ask. All those thoughts, all those intentions, they've been asked. With your authority, with your permission, with your will, let it be done. Let it be done. And we thank you for doing that. Thank you for making a way. Thank you for just showing up and, and doing whatever you do with the door showing up and doing what you do because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we ask all this with and in the authority of Jesus. Amen.